Thanks, Stephanie. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm excited to, to be here this afternoon to talk to you about ExamSoft and how we, as a school, went about um, structuring ourselves and getting ready to use ExamSoft literally in three months. Um, before I start, I just want to you know let you know if you've if you've got questions, please make sure you know either use the chat box or um, you've got something that I'm not you know that you want me to hit on. Please please tell me you know and let's not make the end of the webinar the end of the discussion. You know if you want to get a hold of me, I'll put my contact information up at the end. Um, make sure that you get your questions answered. We can continue the discussion you know however you want, um, but please make sure you get your questions answered. That's important. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I certainly can can provide you a point in the right direction or at least share with you our experiences and what we did here at, uh, at Bergen. Um, just a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I, I work at every place that I've learned. Uh, so I'm a graduate of Bergen Catholic, um, graduate of Iona, graduate of St. Peter's. Um, but pre pretty much what I do at Bergen is I'm the tech guy. I run the laptop program and I'm also the data guy. So I do the scheduling, the um, report card process. Uh, I set up things like ExamSoft and turn it in, and uh, we use Naviance and all that stuff. So I'm the I'm the data guy back and forth. Um, so ExamSoft, I, I kind of do a lot of behind the scenes stuff, but I also use it as a teacher uh, when I teach you computer science. Um, just a little bit about Bergen Catholic. We're um, an old boys school, nine to twelve, uh, seven hundred and roughly forty five boys and sixty teachers. Um, we're that little blue dot. We are not in a New York suburb, but we are in New Jersey, uh, about 20 minutes from New York City, and um, we're a college prep school, so roughly 99% to every senior attends college, um, you know, the following fall when we graduate. We average a class size of around 22 and a half, and our tuition is approximately $16,000 a year. That does not include a laptop, um, other miscellaneous supplies, so, but our tuition itself is roughly right around $16,000 uh, 16, a year, excuse me. Um, how we started with one-to-one, -one, uh, we've been a one-to-one -one school since 2002. Uh, this is not something that's new to us, and technology is not something that's new to the kids nor the faculty. Um, we uh, we used the, the faculty had laptops for a year uh, by themselves before we introduced the students. Then the following year in 2003-2004, uh, we introduced uh, the freshman class with uh, an IBM ThinkPad, uh, and that progressed over four years until uh, 2006, 2007, where every student had a, um, a different Lenovo model. Uh, that stayed the same until uh, 2012, 2013. We introduced the uh, Lenovo tablet, which uh, the kids could write on. Um, we went through that. We were It was okay. And then in March 2013, we announced that we were going Apple in the 14-15 school year. Uh, in the 2012-2013 year, we introduced Google Apps uh, to the student body. Uh, we gave them their own email account. We started really pushing the cloud with them, um, and that has, has been a persistent uh, thing ever since. Uh, 13, 14, for us, was a big thing. We moved to Active Directory. We did a lot of infrastructure changes. Uh, we brought our faculty on board with iPads. We increased our bandwidth, so we really started preparing for the fact that we'd have apples coming in in uh, March, or excuse me, in 14, 15 school year. Um, in 14, 15, uh, our student went, we went to a two-to-one environment. So our, our students, our freshmen, have both MacBooks and iPads. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, we went Google Apps for the faculty. Um, all our freshman textbooks were online. Um, now next year, all our textbooks for all, all four years will be online. Um, we're working with the faculty to develop their own iBooks. Um, half of our, class, our, our school population will be Apple, so we'll have freshmen and sophomores. Um, and we had an opportunity to, uh, for the juniors and seniors to trade in their Lenovo's for, for Macs. Um, so we've got a couple of them that are doing that. So by 1718 will be the absolute latest point that everybody will have MacBooks and iPads. will be a full Apple school at that point. Um, our freshmen, sophomores, and transfer students use an 11-inch MacBook Air uh, and a 32-inch, 32-gig uh, uh, iPad Mini. The reason behind both devices is that you know even as adults we use the the, the right tool at the right time. So um, maybe the laptop isn't appropriate when I'm trying to read you know uh, read a novel or you know read through my textbook. So we have the iPad. Uh, the content creation piece happened on the laptop. Uh, we use the iPad as a reader, but we could also interchange depending on the situation. Um, our juniors and seniors right now have the 230 tablet. Um, we also made sure that it was important that we have insurance on these things. Um, you know, the boys could be pretty rough with them, but we found that the, in general the MacBooks have been much better uh, than the Lenovo's in terms of uh, holding up and wear and tear. 
I do want to mention before I start talking about ExamSoft that I have a student tech team here at Bergen, which we've had in place for a number of years. And it's really helpful because it started with one to two kids after school in, in 2006, 2007, and it grew. This year I had five of them, um, and they really they work hard. They've got the respect of the faculty, and it shows that, you know, and I'm going to talk a lot when I talk about ExamSoft about how we share roles, how those kids can fix issues without having, you know, to wait for me to do things. And I think that's really important. Um, they do important work. They don't do busy work, and they actually get paid. You know, it's not a, it's not a, a service thing. It's not a, um, you know, uh, I just volunteer. They're actually, they work for the school. Um, and I have them, you know, working throughout the summer. They work on, on servicing laptops and getting ready for the next school year. And I think that's a really important component when I start to talk about how we supported ExamSoft. Um, you'll see that that's, um, that's a, a big component of it. Uh, why we went to ExamSoft? Well, here's the question. A, a retired colleague had said this to me um, a while ago. Are we a laptop school or are we a school that uses laptops? Right? And that was a really important question and one that I, I still think about all the time. Are we a laptop school or a school that uses laptops? Now, we're not new to online testing. We were using ExamView for a number of years. Um, and it just wasn't the way for us to go. Um, we wanted something cloud-based. Uh, ExamView relied on a, but don't get me wrong, ExamView is a good, a good program. I'm not going to say that it's not. Um, but we wanted to move in a different direction. They were going to have a cloud-based solution that, that didn't, you know, it didn't pan out in the time we wanted it to. Um, but we really wanted to push online testing. Um, and a good way for us to administer exams. You know, and the other thing that we really wanted to look at and we're, we're continuing to look at is how do we assess? Why do we assess? And it's a question that I pose with my graduate students a lot. You know, why do we assess and how do we assess? Um, and is there a better way that we can assess? So we, you know, it wasn't just to let's get rid of the scantrons. You know, it was, it was let's really see how we assess. And I think that exam soft gives us the opportunity to do that. When I say we went, you know, we got our CBT on in three months. Um, on February 24th, a bunch of us of so this year, we went to St. Joe's by the Sea on Staten Island in New York, uh, and we saw how they implemented the, the, the exam soft and how pleased they were with it. Um, so we were able to do some creative budgeting. We got ourselves together. We started training on March 4th. Um, so March 15th, we let the faculty go. We said, all right, you're going to have time to, to practice, to get yourselves together, because when we take our final exams this year, they will only be administered on ExamSoft. There will be no, um, no Scantrons, uh, no paper. Um, we're going to do purely online. Now, did that make people worry? Yeah. Did it cause anxiety? Absolutely. But we made sure that we took the right steps that we're going to, to, to get there. Um, a couple of the overarching themes that we, that we you know, thought about as we we're implementing ExamSoft, um, sharing is caring. And we made sure that, um, that our teachers had the opportunity to work with one another, that, that those of us that our, our tech team were available. Um, we realized that our teachers are pretty smart people, that they don't need a tech person or a computer person every time to help them with something with ExamSoft. Uh, that we did a lot of working together, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we also realized that if, if you know people aren't moving towards something, they're moving away from it, and that kind of you know that that's a powerful statement because if you weren't moving towards ExamSoft and really wanting to do something different, then you had to be moving away from it. Right? Um, as a tech team, we realized that uh, we had to turn around laptops that were in service rather quickly. Um, you know, we, we made sure that, you know, I, I, my, my student tech team made sure that, that if we got a laptop that was broken or didn't work right, we were, it was a turnaround, uh, it was diagnosed and, and disposed in 24 hours. Uh, we increased our loaner pool, which I'll talk about as well. Um, we had to be as helpful as possible. And the thing that really was important to us um, was that if you had a problem with ExamSoft, it wasn't ExamSoft. You weren't going to blame ExamSoft or the technology for any issues. Now that meant more work for my team. It, made, it meant more work, um, you know, on on the on our part in terms of getting the faculty up to speed. But it, you weren't going to say, "Oh, ExamSoft doesn't work," or you weren't going to say that my laptop doesn't work or our infrastructure doesn't work. You know, everything had to be, in my eyes, perfect to make sure that this went off without a hitch. Uh, and we knew that going forward. So I want to talk about two um, areas. First, about what we did with our faculty and 
some strategies with the faculty, and then I want to talk about our, our game day, uh, what we did in terms of um, our final exams. So when we did the training, when we did the initial webinars with ExamSoft, uh, we did two people to, uh, per department. We had our tech team, two teachers per department. There were a bunch of people that got on and learned how to do this. So they were hopefully going to be the turnaround um, folks that would help people in their department. They would be resources for other teachers. Um, what we did, we set up a student account for each teacher um, so that they could go on. We didn't want them just to be able to preview their test, but we wanted them to feel exactly how a student would. So from the initial log on to taking the test to looking at the portal afterwards, what information will I see, will I not see, how does this work? Um, we, we really wanted them to get the full feel of the software. So we, we gave them all teacher accounts. Uh, we just took their, we put the word FAC or FAC in front of their, their ID number um, so that they could you know, log on as a student and really get a feel for this. Uh, then we had them take school created practice tests. Um, again, so they could start off, let me see as a student, how does the software work? Um, and then we went to, why don't you create a practice test for yourself and take it as a student? Okay. And then we said, once you feel comfortable with that, let's try it with your class. Okay. Now the idea with this was make a practice test, whatever your content area was, but take it with them. Don't penalize the kids um, the first time around. So, because this stuff is all new to them too. The idea is that everyone's learning together, that the kids, the teachers, let's, here's a test. Um, it's not going to count, it's not going to penalize against you. As a teacher, I might say, well, I'll, it'll, I'll, it'll be a 10-point quiz. Everybody gets a 10 out of 10 just for trying. But let's try the software. Let's see how you get in. Let's see how you answer a question. Um, let's see how, uh, when you finish, how do you submit, all that kind of stuff. Then let's also, you know, if there are any, any issues that come up with that. Are there any issues with, you know, submitting your test or answering a question, all that kind of stuff. So once we practice, it's like, how do we gradually incorporate uh, into the curriculum? So by the time we get to a final exam, this is all the kids know. Okay? They're not going to know anything different. They're not going to be thinking about, I need a pencil to take my Scantron test, but how do I, you know, I, need, I know that I need to have my, my laptop together or my iPad and it's ready to go. Um, because we're still a, a two different platforms with our devices, we use um, SoftTest both on the iPad and we use it on the laptop. Um, so this year they kind of had a choice in terms of how they uh, how they took the test, but going forward, all the kids that are Apple uh, have Apple devices will only use it on the iPad. Um, we also encouraged the teachers to take each other's tests. You know, make uh, if I'm in the same department as my buddy, make me a student in your class so that I can take your test to in, you know look for mistakes uh, if there's anything issues with the questions. You know, it's not like we could take a, a, a an exam from 10 years ago, Xerox it you know, or cut and paste and I have a test that may not be numbered correctly or have typographical errors, we encourage the teachers to, to take each other's tests. And that cut down a lot on, wait a minute, there's, there's um, five questions are labeled number 37 uh, and they don't have, you know, they don't have the right answers to them. So that, that was huge. All this stuff here was, I think, our kind of, our recipe or, or, or our steps, how we were successful. Uh, again, making sure, you know, recognizing that our faculty are smart people, recognizing that sharing is the way to go. Um, how we supported them, and I think this was this was key. Um, we did class push-in. Um, so I had a teacher come to me and say, I've got, you know, I've got my test ready. I wanna I wanna give the kids a, you know, their first quiz, but would you be there for the first couple of minutes to to help me? Absolutely. So I come in. You know, the teacher's giving the directions and all that kind of stuff. I'm making sure that the kids are in guided access on their iPads. They've downloaded the test. You know, they're waiting for their the, the password from the teacher. Um, and then once the kids were on, I'm, I'm done. Like, I can just kind of, you know, I, I'm leaving because they're, they're, they're good to go. Because the only thing I have left to do is submit. Um, I might stay. In some cases, I would stay for the entire period. Uh, and make sure that the kids submitted the test properly or, you know, stand there with the teacher. And the teacher would, you know check the submissions and I'm just there to make sure you know if the teacher had any problems and it was a comfort a comfort blanket which was fine because that's what we wanted to make sure that there were no excuses you know and that there was every option available for these teachers we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, you know those of us that went through the training would sit down with other teachers if they needed 
specific questions. I know we had some questions, you know, let's say, well, with math, uh, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, you know, or, well, how do I do this in my class? This is what I want to do. Um, we, the other thing, when I said sharing is caring, we had teachers sit in on other teachers' classes. Now, this, for the kids, some of them were really surprised when we said, you know, uh, I might have Mrs. Smith sitting in my class today because she's going to um, look at um, how I administer a test. Okay, for me, for the kids, it's a great way, you know, to see that the faculty is modeling learning from other people, from, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, the teachers learn, too, and we're learning from one another. Um, and then I had said to my class, you know, if this teacher who's observing the class has a question, please answer the question for them. You know, if they ask you, well, how do you navigate between questions or how do you type in an answer, show them how to do that. Um, and, and I think the faculty found this pretty helpful because it was, let's see how it works in an actual live context. We're not doing it in a practice context with a bunch of other teachers. It's in a real classroom. Um, and again, promoted collegiality. You know, it promoted that, you know, if, if we all share and we kind of help one another, we're going to make this successful. Um, I would send out periodic uh, email reminders and I would, you know, target specific things. So, for example, one of the things um, we had, uh, you know, the download and upload time. We had teachers that would set the download time. There was like a 10-minute window to download the test. Or, you know, upload time. If you didn't upload, on, you know, by the end of the period, you couldn't upload. So I would send them some directions with some screenshots. Um, maybe next year we're hoping to work on some, some, some videos specific to our institution so that they can watch them and see, you know, this is, this is how I do X. Because there are some skills that, you know, we, said, we saw right away, like I said, the upload and download time. That was a problem initially. I'd have 20 kids in my office going, I can't upload my test. Well, once I, you know, extended the upload time, there wasn't a problem, right? Um, the other thing that we, we shared with some folks were, uh, were sample questions. Um, you know, some people tell, well, how do I... How do I put a question in, you know, in, in, in exam soft? I, I, you know, how do I put in a, I've got a, a, a graph, let's say, like this. I've got a math question, okay? Um, I made this question myself. I didn't write it because I'm not that smart. But um, I did a, uh, this was a, uh, a graph. It's a screenshot of a generated test, okay? So we had a, a, a test generator that generates a PDF file with a test in it. So I took the, uh, the angle and the directions. I screenshot that, imported it as an image file, and then I used the math editor for the actual answers. Um, so it looks, you know, that this is something that, you know, maybe yesterday was, well, how do I do this? How do I put this on a, um, uh, how do I put it on a, um, uh, into exam soft as a question? And now it's, you know, oh, I can do this. I don't have to worry about, you know, changing the style of my questions and whatnot. I can take questions from others spots and just, um, you know, copy and paste them and put them in. And this was the kind of modeling, you know, if I, if I, if I showed a teacher, oh, this is how you can do this, then they could show somebody else or, you know, and this wasn't only good for math, it, it was helpful in science, even in world languages, um, where, you know, the language and, and some of the, um, the characters and stuff were important, you could do the same kind of thing. So it was once we kind of planted that seed, it was, oh, wow, this is kind of pretty cool. Uh, and, and it just, it kind of went from there. Um, the other thing that we tried to encourage, we didn't do a lot of it this year, but we're hoping to next year, in terms of, you know, higher order thinking, you know, and going back to my question of how we assess, um, I teach AP Computer Science, so this is a question about recursion. Now, I could, you know, on a Bloom's taxonomy scale say, you know, which of the following best describes the concept of recursion, okay, and that's nice, and that would, you know, it, that would be a basic test if you know what recursion is, but in terms of a higher level, I could put in a piece of code here that says, what's the output of the following method? Okay, um, so I'm testing at a higher level. I'm, you know, I'm forcing the kids to think at a level that's a little bit more intensive than just a, a simpler level. So this whole process, I can look at, and we encourage our teachers to look at all the questions you ask. And are these the right questions you want to ask? Are you asking the right questions? Are you asking questions that are uh, primarily lower level? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but are, is, there, is there a better way to ask these questions? Do you want to potentially take those questions to a higher level and ask something that requires more creative thought? You know, and this is still a multiple choice question. I can make it multiple choice. I can make it, you know, fill in the blank. Um, however, but it at least gave our, our teachers some thought. Let's look at 
all these questions you've accumulated for, for how long you've been teaching, you know, are they the right questions you want to ask? And, you know, and some of mine I found that, like, these are, you know, I definitely was able to, to distinguish between the lower level ones and the higher level ones. And I really want to push the higher level questions because this, to me, I could get a better idea of if a kid understands recursion as opposed to which of the following best describes the concepts of recursion. So this was one of the things, um, you know, we try to, an overarching thing we looked at, too, is let's look at all our questions, all our assessments. Are they good? Do we need to find new ones? You know, and if so, then how do we go about finding those type of questions? Or do we have to write our own? Do we need to take some time to write our own questions? So we get to March 15th, um, ready, set, download. We said to all the students, we're going to at least get everybody on. We want you to download um, soft tests. We then found out after about 45 seconds that it just brought our network to a standstill. Um, no one could get on. Um, none of us could understand why they couldn't get on. We then found out at that point that our content filter and our firewall, both Cisco, couldn't handle our web traffic. They were outdated and misconfigured. So we put in these two devices, the, uh, the Barracuda content filter and firewall, five days before our senior exams, and not a moment too soon, because um, we did not have any other issues moving forward uh, with, our, um, with our infrastructure. Uh, we want to make sure, again, that when a kid logs on and takes their test, there wasn't going to be an issue in terms of, um, I can't get on, I can't download my test, I can't upload my test, um, you know. So this this was important, and we did it just in the nick of time. Um, so and it's worth me mentioning because, you know, we weren't going to run the risk of, we've got 200 kids waiting to take a test and they can't get on the internet to, to get the test. So this, this was a, a critical piece uh, of how we did things. So the way we used to do, now we do as a Catholic school, our seniors finish a couple of days early, or maybe like two or three weeks earlier than the underclassmen, they take their final exams first. So while the underclassmen are still in class, the seniors are taking final exams. So this is how we used to, they would take their test. Um, they would go, they would take a four-day period after the seniors finish their classes, this is like the end of May, they take their exams <coughs> by subject. So the first two periods on Monday they take English, then they take math in periods three and four, so forth and so on. They could be absent, uh, excuse me, they could be exempt if they had fewer than um, six absences, so five, um, less than or equal to five absences, and an average, a second semester average of at least a 93, they could get exempt. Now, problems with this model, it's a pain to schedule to try and figure out, well, I've got a senior class in room one, first period. There's an underclassman class in room two, in room one, second period. I've got to move them because the seniors need two periods to take their test. Uh, if you've got kids with conflict, so if I take like two maths or two sciences on the same day, when do I take the makeup test? Where does that have to be? Who's going to proctor it? Um, it's a lot of work to try and figure all this stuff out. I'm not even the one that's responsible for, for scheduling, but I can say that it's a lot of work. So as we're starting to look at, you know, we've got exam soft, we're trying to figure out, well, how do I, how do we do this potentially in a different way? Now, our, we have a, a, a modular, uh, a rotating drop schedule. So it looks like this. So my class that meets on day one, period one, will not meet again until day three, period six, then it rotates, rotates up. So we started floating around the question, well, what if we schedule exams by period? Rather than doing it by subject area, what if we say on the first day of exams, you take your day one period one test and then your day one period two class? And it didn't matter how we, you know, how we scramble this, um, but over a four-day period, we could do two exams per day, and then the last exam would be any makeups or conflicts or whatever. Now, this is revolutionary. I graduated from Burke College in 1995, and for the four years prior to that, we took our exams by subject area. So this was a totally new thing for us. It was, you know, almost, it was unheard of, you know, but we kind of committed, let's, let's, let's try this and let's see if it works, you know, and then moving forward, it's something we could, we could do, um, you know, we could do every year. So this year's senior class, 215 kids, uh, and our, our, our initial thought was, okay, well, how do we schedule the rooms? We put them all in the gym. And this is what we did. We put 215 kids in the gym. Now, you can see that that's me in the pink shirt with the, with the big arrow. Um, our biggest concerns were Wi-Fi. We've got one access point in there. Can we handle it? 
Absolutely. Because the exam saw traffic wasn't taking a lot. The tests weren't that big. We told all the kids to download their tests before um, their, their exam day. And all their teachers made sure that all the tests were downloaded. So pretty much the idea was you walk into that gym and say to your teacher, give me my password. I'm ready to go. So everything's downloaded, no issues. Now, power. Our Lenovo's needed. The batteries aren't what the MacBooks are. Um, so what we did, I'll show you this, the next slide, um, how we did with the power. We bought a big, um, a, in essence, big power strips. Um, so that wasn't an issue. Um, and what we did, because this was so new, now the teachers, the classroom teachers were there proctoring their particular classes. So you have, you know, one class is over here, one's over here. Every couple of tables was a different class. Um, we verified, the tech support folks in this middle table, we verified that every exam was submitted. Okay, because the teachers, some, really for the teachers that didn't know exactly how to do that or weren't comfortable, we made sure everything was submitted. So no kid left that gym without submitting a test. Um, that gave the teachers a degree of comfort, um, and I think that was, you know, that was a, a nice selling point. Um, the other thing that was good with this, with this setup, and, you know, I've got a teacher over here, I've got a teacher over here, I've got potentially anywhere from seven to ten teachers plus the tech people in the middle. We're, we're, we're watching for wandering eyes. We're watching for anything in terms of academic dishonesty. There wasn't any, but now I've got 10 sets of eyes monitoring the room that ordinarily I might have one set of eyes. Okay, so that was a big, a, a big plus too. You know, a kid who, well, we might say, well, look, these two kids right here are sitting next to each other. They could be looking, but I've got, you know, teacher, 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 and there wasn't an issue in terms of that. So that was a, a I like the setup. If I could fit 745 kids in the gym, I would do it. I think this was a great, a great way to do our senior exams. Uh, in terms of the power, this is what we used. We found them on Amazon um, for roughly $30. There are these long strips um, with 12 outlets and a nice long cable. So we use these in the classrooms for the underclassmen exams, but in the gym, we just put them down. We put some tape on the cables. And again, we, the, well, my battery is, you know, is dead. Well, you can plug in and charge. There was ample opportunity to charge. We didn't have any issues with the power. We made sure of that beforehand. Um, but, you know, power wasn't going to be a problem. When you were the Lenovo's, if you were taking two exams, you weren't going to have enough battery to last you four hours. Um, so this was our solution. And they work they worked fabulous. No, no major issues at all. So after we did our senior exams, we debriefed. Okay, what, what, what went well, what didn't go well? Um, the biggest problem we had was kids with loners. Um, and requiring additional uploads. So we told them, like I said before, download before the exam starts. But if you had a legitimate hardware or software problem, uh, if something happened to your computer between the time you downloaded and the time you started the test, you need another download. <coughs> um, if you forgot your laptop at home, we had a couple of those. We made sure we had loaners available. Again, we're not going to blame exam software. We're not going to blame the technology. We had loaners available. Um, those machines. The kids were given loaners, and right away we would diagnose and, and work on repairing those machines. Um, that probably, and even with the underclassmen, was the biggest issue was, was additional uploads. The kids got one upload. If they needed a second one, we would boost that. Um, the teachers that were comfortable doing that did it on their own. If they didn't, you know, they came to the table and said, I, need, I can't download my test, um, and we took care of it right away. Um, students with extended time, we put them in the library for their entire test time. So this way, if, if they had you know time and a half or double time, whatever the case was, they were in one location. They weren't in the gym for a part of it and then going up to the learning center for another part of it. They were in their one space for the entire time. Um, there were a couple kids that, for whatever reason, couldn't get on the Wi-Fi to post their exam. Very few. So in my office, I had unfiltered access set up, so they would just plug in their laptop, and they wouldn't be, um, you know, they'd get right on the Internet, and they were able to uh, upload their tests without any issues. Um, one of the things we did find, though, that faculty who, um, when they didn't post their exam in the same folder or they didn't use a unique name, and that's something we have to work on for next year, you know, I had a couple of teachers call their final exam, final exam. And when the kids go to download it, they didn't know whose they were downloading. Um, or they would, you know, I would, I'm looking for their test because I might have to up a download uh, or, you know, change their, their upload time or whatever the case is, and I can't find it because, um, it's in a folder where I would never look for it. So one of the things we're going to look at, you know, for next year is, is how do we organize our folder so that I know that under your 
under your teacher name, you've got a folder that final exam 2016, and, and all your exams are there. Um, we didn't have any lost exams, you know, in the past where you did it on paper. You, a proctor did the test. You, you know, the, our our teachers didn't proctor their own test. We had proctors do it, so there could have been a lost test. Had none of that. No shenanigans whatsoever. The kids were honest. They were they were on task, doing what they should have been. There was no opportunity for them to do anything otherwise. By virtue of the fact they were being watched by you know ten people, so it really it worked well. Um, you know we didn't have any any major problems um, with the apps. Actually, I'm saying major problems. We didn't have any problems. Um, let me make that clear. There wasn't any you know oh this was a problem. We learned some stuff, but nothing that we would classify as a problem. Uh, kids that were absent, we would repost the test. We would force them. Uh, we would force the teachers to use a download password if they didn't use one, or a different one if they had one. Um, so that that kid had to download the um, the test in person immediately before the test. Um, there's a different assessment password, um, and then we're toying with how to post it uh, either in a makeup folder or whatever the case was. That we're still we're still kind of trying to feel that one out. But um, the big thing was that you had to download your test in person um, if you were absent. And if you were if you were absent and had it already, you couldn't start taking it um, without. Uh, Without a new password, um, our concern was that maybe absent kids would get the password and, and do the test. Um, we found a thing with ExamSoft, and the, the tech support folks at ExamSoft were fabulous. Um, the clock wasn't adjusting when you resumed, so you go in, you go into the test, you take 10 minutes, I take a picture of every question, um, and then when I go back in a day later, I still have an hour and I have to take my test. So with ExamSoft's help, we were able to at least the clock now runs down regardless of uh, if your machine's in <coughs> standby or not. Uh, it won't properly resume code, but at least it will show us that a kid went on before they should have. And by the way, we didn't have any issues with this stuff. There were no kids that went on and looked at the test ahead of time. There were no kids that were trying to, to pull any of this stuff um, because we knew the kids that weren't there when they showed up for their, their makeup test, you know, we would we'd go through and check their logs and whatnot um, more thoroughly. So our senior exams went off without a hitch. Um, then it came time for underclassmen. Now the old way, and this is this is for the 560 roughly kids we had left in the building. Um, we would um, same thing. We would schedule half of two different classes in the same room. So English one CP and English two CP are in the same room, half and half. Um, you'd be assigned the proctor. It wouldn't be your own teacher proctoring your test. On the first day, English, math, whatever, um, you had to provide the proctor with an envelope with your exams in it, scrap, essay paper. Uh, there's always an issue. Well, if my, you know, I, I would give 20 tests, I got 18 back because two of them ended up in another folder in another class. Um, when do I take a makeup? Um, you know, when is it scheduled? It, it, it was, a, it's a scheduling nightmare to try and schedule this stuff. But again, we've been doing it like this for at least 25 years. So now. With ExamSoft, we say, okay, um, we're going to do it by period again. Same thing, one exam per day, and then one day we did a double. And it didn't matter we, how we rotated it. We made sure that, you know, at, a, at Bergen, you take seven classes. One of those classes is your general period, your gym, computers, art, whatever. So you don't have a final exam in that class. You didn't get to come to school that day. You had a day off, a study day, a reading day, whatever you want to call it. Um, we... So we, we juggled around where's going to be the impact of, you know, what kids are going to get a day off when, um, but that wasn't a big deal. We centrally located tech support. We had a table in the hallway, so if we had issues with kids, again, it was uploads. Uh, we didn't have any major issues at all. Um, it was basically I need another upload because my computer, something happened to my computer. Um, you know, I, I think I might have had one issue that was weird. It was some kind of license thing with ExamSoft. Never seen it before. Got the kid a loaner. We actually reimaged his computer. By the time he's done with his first test, so by the time he took his second test, he had his own computer back. Um, there wasn't anything major. I can't even, you know, I could try and say, well, that could have been a major issue, but it, we didn't have anything major. There were none. You know, we were kind of waiting for cautiously where where is the where is going to be the big problem that no one saw coming. There weren't. Kids came in, they took their tests, they went home. Um, we got some of our faculty were like, wow, this is really cool. You know, I really thought it was going to be bad, but this is really cool. I like it. Um, so it was it was really it was really cool um, to see that kind of stuff. Um, 
we did have, uh, I had a, a student come in my office and say to me, you know, my, my exam just randomly stopped. And it just, it, it, it exam flow closed for no reason, and it, it, you know, I wasn't done. So we, we went to the logs, and it really didn't randomly close. You, you were timed out at 10.43 and 19 seconds, you know. And the kid kind of stood there and looked at me dumbfounded because he, he, there was nowhere he'd go with this because those logs are so detailed that I know exactly what you were doing. Um, you know, two seconds before that, you know, you were on a question. But then you timed out, you had your, your time, and this is what happened. So your exam soft randomly closing? No, not really. I had a child tell me that his computer randomly turned off. We looked. Um, sorry. No, your device had 5% or less battery at 10.30 and 6 seconds. And at 10.32 and 29 seconds, um, you uh, actually at 10.32 and 25, excuse me, you, your computer went to sleep because, you know, you were, um, your battery ran out. So my computer randomly turned off. No, sorry, it didn't, you know. And once th uh, maybe like three or four kids had these type of issues, they went away real quick um, in terms of, you know, oh, maybe if I tell Mr. Spiegel that my computer did this, once they knew that the logs were out there, we, you know, I said before, no shenanigans, there were no shenanigans because the log defended it's amazing how much the, these logs hold in terms of good information. Um, in terms of our classrooms for the underclassmen, the way we set things up, um, we had a, uh, well, the teacher really creative. This was one that I kind of liked. We put, um, they put, you know, the kids facing each other down the middle, uh, two rows of that, and then they had the one, uh, one group over here that was against the wall, because this is, you can't see it, but this, there's a wall right here. Um, there were two couple kids over here. So they were creative in how they laid out the room. Um, this one I like just as much because it was a uh, let's put the two kids you know face to face like Battleship almost. Um, you had all these kids playing Battleship, so you know, and if a kid was looking from one desk to another, there was enough space that it really kind of they would have to strain to do it. Um, so that worked out real well. Um, now, in terms of um, printing tests, this was I think like my my. If there was a stat that could say how powerful using online testing was in May of 2014, now this isn't really scientific, but in May of 2014, our faculty printed 92,096 pages in the month of, of May in 2014. So getting ready to, you know, getting their exams copied and whatnot, getting them ready. Um, this year, this year, we printed 15,000 pages. It was set almost 77,000 pages less. 153 reams of paper we saved by going online with our tests. When I looked at this, I did it three times to make sure I had someone else look at it too to make sure that the numbers were right. 77,000 fewer pages in one month using ExamSoft. It's 153 reams of paper. That's 15 cases of paper we saved by going this route. Because our teachers, even though we we um, we administered our exams for the underclassmen in June, pretty much everybody is preparing them in May, putting them in envelopes and whatnot. So we really, we really made out well uh, from a printing standpoint of how much paper we didn't use, how much toner we didn't use, how much aggravation we saved by faculty going to, you know, standing at the, the, the copy machine, you know, waiting for copies that didn't staple right, oh, i got to print it again and whatnot. This was a real telltale sign that we did something, you know, I, I dare say right. Now, for next year, some of the stuff we'd like to look at. I alluded to this before. Our questions. Um, Looking at all the questions we're using, uh, higher order thinking, our folder organization. Uh, do we write new questions? Clean up the old questions. Let's look at every question that we use for assessment and see if it's it's good. Um, the idea of creating an assessment portfolio so that the kids can, you know, if we administer every quiz, every test, every exam on ExamSoft, there's a great way to study for our, our you know, our midterm and final exams. All our stuff is in one spot. I don't know if that well. Where's my test from? You know, two months ago, I want to study for that, or I want to use that to to study for something else. It's all it's an assessment portfolio, and we're hoping that maybe we can grow that. Um, I'm a big data guy, uh, and I think that there's a ton of analytical stuff that we could use within ExamSoft to make curricular decisions. You know, for example, why did 20 students get this question wrong? Now I can look at you know the breakdown by student and whatnot. That's one from a question standpoint. Why did so many kids get the question wrong? Not 20 kids did get it wrong. Why did they get it wrong? 
you know, did they all choose the same response? Were they fooled by a certain response? You know, and then I can target my instruction based on, you know, uh, on those specific uh, specific questions. The other thing I think we should look at is in terms of our exam taker data. How long do students take the test? How do they take it? Do they go from 1 to 20? Do they skip around? Do they answer the questions they know first and go back? Um, how much time do they spend per question? You know, um, do questions that I think might be easy, kids are spending two, three, four minutes on a question, and if that's the class average, maybe I need to revisit that question. You know, does every student finish with the test within a lot of time? Am I writing tests that are too hard or too easy? Um, so it's just as much as there's question data that's available, I think we need to look at exam taker data so we get a better idea of our exam takers and how they behave in terms of, you know, how they take the tests, how much time they're taking, um, you know, and, and it's almost like, you know, looking at shopping data from a marketing standpoint. I'm looking at it from an exam taker standpoint. And then some of those advanced features like rubrics and whatnot, you know, maybe getting into them uh, would be nice, you know, in, in 15, 16. So I think we've got, you know, our work cut out for us. Um, I want to say that um, it, I'm going to put on my content information, but I want to say a couple of things. It wasn't difficult. As much as this might look like a lot of work, it really wasn't. We had a, a, a dedicated group of people that, that really bought into this early on and were able to help out one another. Um, we understood the, the, the goal. This is where we want to go. And, and standing in that gym and watching 215, you know, kids take a test, and not having, you know, issues of I lost my test, I couldn't get on, I couldn't. There were no excuses. It really was a solid, a solid thing. And, you know, have you told me in February that we're going to do it for finals? Even me, as a, as a tech guy, I was kind of, you know, that's kind of a, you know, that's a short amount of time. But you know what? <clears throat> I think in the end, it really, it really was worth it. Our faculty was bought on. Uh, I know they're excited about using it next year. Did it, did it cause some anxiety? Sure. Did it cause some, um, some people to kind of, you know, uh, um, to fight us a little bit? Yeah. You know, we didn't, everyone just didn't jump on board. But as they started to see it, I think we won over. Even some of the people that were naysayers going, this is, this is you know, I'm not using this. To then, you know, oh, this really wasn't so bad. You know, and I think that really that really helped. And then as people started talking to one another, it's oh, you know what? It really isn't that bad. And knowing that they had support available, whether it was my computer, whether it was I don't know how to check to make sure the kid you know took the test, whatever the case was, you know, it was serves with a smile. There was people there to help them, and I think that was key because if we didn't do that, this this wouldn't have worked at all. Um, so I'm glad that we were you know we were able to do that. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to doing it next year. Um, you know, um, what that's pretty much what I wanted to, to, to kind of share with you, but I do want to make sure that you've got time to ask me questions. So I'm going to stop talking, um, which, you know, I hear applause. Um, please, if you've got questions, ask me questions, however you want to ask me questions. I should say, too, if you, if you all of a sudden think of a question in an hour, send me an email. If you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, that's fine. Or if you've got a group of people you want to talk to, we do a little hangout, do FaceTime, that's fine. I want you to get your questions answered. You know, I want you to talk to somebody who's done it, um, who could give you, you know, if you've got a specific issue, I'm trying to do X, Y, or Z. Let's talk about it. I, I don't, you know, I, I was very grateful when we went to St. Joseph's in, in February that we were able to see this stuff and really get our questions answered, and I want to pay that forward. So if you've got questions or concerns, there's my contact information. Please make sure... You get in touch with me. Um, you know, uh, whatever I can do to help you out is certainly uh, I will do that. Um, so I think that's it. Um, certainly. So I think Stephanie is is somewhere in cyberspace, and if she wants to, uh, if you want to chime in and take questions or whatever, we, wherever we need to go, uh, I'm I'm standing by. Sounds great, Al. Thank you so much for the presentation. As Al said, we're going to go ahead and open up the forum for a Q&A. Just as a reminder, if you do have a question for Al, now is a good time to type it into the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel. It should be on the right-hand side of your screen. We already have a couple waiting for us, so we're going to go ahead and jump in. Uh, but if you do have one, go ahead and pose it now. So Al, the first question is, so there's no need for internet during the actual exam, is that correct? During the yeah, during the actual exam, you don't need internet. Um, before you need internet beforehand to download the test, 
and then after the test to upload it. Um, but um, during the test, it, if you're using the iPad, you've got to put the, the iPad in airplane mode and in guided access. So exam, a soft test is the only thing you can use. And what I will say is that I asked some of my smart kids, I said, all right, jailbreak your iPad and try to take a test on ExamSoft. And they couldn't do it. I said, break it. Find a way. Here's a, here's a practice test. Find a way to hack this test and get in. And they couldn't. You know, and I think that was that was part of that was also a reassuring thing that I could say to the faculty, hey, I had kids jailbreak and I had these kids that are smarter than I am go in and try and hack the test and they couldn't do it. Um, but specifically for the test, you do not need the internet, you just need it before and after. Um, it lends itself nice to if they're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do something uh, an assessment at home where they might not necessarily have internet connection or internet connectivity, they can um, they can upload it as soon as as soon as they get back on the internet, uh, they'll upload the test. Great, thank you. And this is kind of a follow-up question, but does this work on any other platform besides laptops? Um, the, the I've seen there's there it'll work on a Windows-based machine and a it's primarily made for an iOS device, but it'll work on a on on OS X and you know, a Mac OS or a Windows. Um, I, there's no Android app or anything else, but it'll it's primarily built for the iPad. So and it, and it works. I I think it's the, it, it works best on the iPad. The only thing that I've, I've heard, um, I don't want to say grumblings, but if I'm typing an essay, if I'm taking an essay test, typing it on the iPad, um, on the screen itself is a little, I might not be able to type as fast, but we're going to try next year, you know, we'll let the kids bring in like a Bluetooth keyboard if they want to use that for the iPad. Um, you know, I don't think that's a, a big deal. Um, so, but yeah, iPad is, is the way to go. Yeah, and just to clarify, the, the the software works on any type of lab, you know, like a computer lab, desktop computer, Mac or PC laptops, um, and then iPads and Surface Pro devices is what it's available on currently. Um, uh, next question is, how did you hear about the system? Do you have advice for board approval slash purchasing? We. We heard about it, actually, believe it or not, from our, our, our Apple uh, account rep. We met with her in, I think, January. Or we, I, I, wanna, I don't know exactly the time. I know we heard about it from Apple. They said, oh, you got to see St. Joseph's by the Sea on Staten Island, you know, because they do this, and this is how they test. And they're a one-to-one -one iPad school. So we had called them up, and we went to, to see it. And I, I honestly, I think on the way back, we were, you know, we were so impressed with how clean it was and, and you know, how, how, how it was. We just... We said we got to do this, um, you know. And, and in terms of board approval and whatnot, we're, you know, we're not going to. And it kind of sounds, it kind might sound, you know, raw, but here, here it comes. We can't. If we're going to be a laptop school, we can't use second best, and we can't do things that aren't 21st century. You know, we're a 21st century school, and we can't do that if we're still giving paper tests, and we can't do that if we're still, if, you know. If we're telling kids turn turn you know turn off your laptops and that kind of thing or put them away, um, I think showing it, demonstrating it, but not not me demonstrating it. You know, let me let me give you a test. You know, if you've got the capability to give you know your board here's an iPad and let's let's take a test on it. You know, uh, and, and and even better having that demonstrated by teachers and having students help them to show them that it's really you know going back to the sharing is caring and collegiality. Um, it's one thing if me as the tech guy shows it, but if you've got the kids in there and the, the, the board's actually taking a, a test on the software, uh, on the iPad, it's great. Um, I would also say if you're a BYOD school and you're using iPads, this is, you know, it, it's, it, it gives the board a nice idea, of, oh, this is how it would be if I brought in my iPad, you know, oh, it would, you know, it would work. Or even better, if they have an iPad, let them use it too. Um, but I think it, it comes best when it comes from the teachers and the students, not from the tech guy. Awesome. Next uh, question is again a little bit of a follow-up. Was there any pushback from parents? None. I mean, I I don't I don't want to say none, but nothing that came to my attention. Nothing in terms of, um, you know, what, well, what we anticipated was, well, my kid, um, you know, the, the computer died in the middle of the test, or I didn't get enough time, whatever the case is. But nothing that got as far as me. You know, if there were issues, they were handled with the classroom teacher. But I certainly didn't hear anything of you know. I, I did get what we um, 
we really started reminding these kids probably around April 1st, your laptop, your, your devices, I keep saying laptop, your devices have to work for final exams. There's, you, you cannot have a broken machine or a machine that doesn't work. Uh, and we, every day, we hammered that home. Every teacher, hey, it's got to work. There's no issues. Um, and I think then the parents realized that, you know, they're, they're you know, I want to, well, I, I, let, me, let me answer it this way. I didn't get any complaints from parents, but I got a little bit more volume in terms of, hey, is my kid's laptop ready? You know, um, he's got a problem. Can he come and see you tomorrow morning? I started to see more of that because the kids, they, they really need it to take a test. And there's, you know, if, if you know, if the loaner pool is gone, then, they, they need something, so I got it in that regard of, oh, is my kid's laptop, you know, going to work, or is it, when is it going to be fixed, but I didn't get any complaints from the parents in terms of, you know, oh, this doesn't work, this is awful, my kid got screwed out of points, nothing, absolutely nothing, it, it worked, you know, it worked the way it should. Okay, last question that we have in the queue uh, for the moment is, what was the faculty buy-in process like? Um, it, 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 we didn't we didn't go with the textbook way of you know change management. Um, and at first that I was kind of leery myself, but we went. This is how it's going to be. We're going to help you get there, but this is how it's going to be. And it took them a while. Again, some bought in right away because people that were using ExamView, it was just a natural transition. Some people. Uh, one of the things I, I would have loved to highlight was um, I, a teacher in our oral language department. Um, it, traditionally, um, they would give a listening portion of their exam um, before the actual final exam, and then, like, the teacher would read out something, a paragraph, and the kids would have to answer questions. She actually recorded all that and embedded it into ExamSoft. So the kids sat there with their headphones, and they took their listening part of their exam, you know? So all of a sudden, it was like, oh, this is really cool. Did it take me five days to get that to work? Yeah, but now that I've got that skill... It was like, oh, this is great. I can do, I can give formative assessments like this during the school year rather than waiting for the one summative one with listing. I can do this periodically now. Um, so some of them bought in. Some of them, it, it was a struggle. I'm not going to lie. It, it, what, everyone just didn't just jump at this. But there were some that, you know, it was, it was, it was a fight. Um, and there are probably people that are convinced this is not the way to go. But, but how are we going to prepare kids for the 21st century? You know, if we're a college prep school, if we're preparing them to, to, you know, to do anything that requires a certification past high school, they're going to take that test on a computer. You know, how do we get them ready for that? And I just think this is this was a great way to do it. And you know, we yeah, we made enemies, but if you're looking at the institution as a whole, what's the best thing for the institution as a whole? It was to go in this direction. And you know, we support the faculty. Don't get me wrong, but. You know, it, it was just we're, we, we weren't going to remain stagnant because of the concerns of two or three people. We were, we were moving forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Al. We really appreciate your presentation. Absolutely. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up, uh, folks. We'd like to uh, thank all of you for taking time out of what I know is a very busy time of the year. Everybody's getting ready for the fall semester. Uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate your attendance. Just as a reminder, uh, when you do X out of the uh, webinar today, you will get a pop-up with a five-question survey. We would really appreciate anybody taking the time to fill that out, if at all possible. Uh, and we do have uh, actually a bunch of upcoming webinars uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, when you get a chance, visit us at examsoft.com forward slash resources and uh, take a look at what we have coming up to see if there's anything that you'd like to uh, register for. You will receive an email in the next couple of days that will have a link to the recording to this webinar, so feel free to share that as you would like. Again, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you, Al, for your wonderful presentation, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Stephanie.